Hi, Internet. How's everybody doing? My name is Matthias, a.k.a. Major VFX, on all the social things here at the Maxon booth at SIGGRAPH 2023. We are showcasing how Maxon One is used in many, many workflows, and one of which, a component of Maxon One, is ZBrush. And here with one of our master trainers on ZBrush, Ian Robinson. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to SIGGRAPH 2023. Thank you, Matthias, for that amazing intro. So my name is Ian Robinson. I am the lead senior trainer here for ZBrush, and we teach all things sculptural. And what's really cool about ZBrush, if you don't know, is that it was designed with artists in mind. It was designed as a 2.5D painting program, which if you don't know, that's painting with depth. So if you want to put a little dot on top of a dot on top of a dot, that's 2.5D. But then later, somewhere down the line, it got integrated into sculpting, and then it took off in 2008 with a little film called Lord of the Rings. You might have heard of it, and it started blowing up ever since then. What's really cool about ZBrush is that it takes the workflow for like games, VFX, films, all that good stuff, and it basically flipped it on its head, allowing the artist to create freely and effectively and worry about the procedural stuff later. Now, as you might have seen, if you, if you checked out the guy before me, his name was Chad Perkins. He's an awesome artist. He actually had this whole idea about Gothic architecture, and he reached out to me and said, hey, I'm not a sculptor, but you are, and I need a gargoyle. And what's cool about gargoyles is they're probably the most grotesque thing I've ever seen, and it's also the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Which, little fun fact, you're going to get stuff like this from me today. Gargoyles, as you see here, were actually called grotesques not gargoyles. The gargoyle is more like a rain gutter for a castle that had little kind of like cute little decor. And then somewhere along the line, we just got mixed up and now everything's just a gargoyle. So that's, so there you go, a little random fact. But today I'm going to cover how I approach this sculpture. And I'm going to do it in about 15 minutes. But even before we get into that, so I don't lose anybody, how many here physically raise of hands of UZ brush? Cool, okay, awesome. So, and most of the time I get this, the UI. What's going on? Come on. And I'm like, yeah, all right. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to break down how to get started in ZBrush. And then we're going to turn around. And I'm going to show you how I approach this with some fun elements. So if you have about five, 10 minutes to bear with me on the getting started part, then we'll get through this. So very first thing is the comma key. The comma key opens up this beautiful thing called the light box right up here at the top. And this is where a lot of projects and assets start. Now, most of the time, you're going to see something a little bit like this when you start up ZBrush. And you're already like, that's too much, dude. What are you doing? Well, the first thing is this little guy right here. Don't worry about this little guy. We're just going to close him down for now. We'll get to that later. And now you have all of this. And you want to start sculpting. So the way ZBrush is designed, it has what I call controlled chaos. And we're just going to figure out a couple things. First thing is, every one of these assets here, these are project files. So the way I get you started in ZBrush is you double click this sphere, say, no, we don't want to save anything because we didn't do anything. And now I have a sphere. And if you just look at this, if you can do this, you are an artist. And you've already, you're already ZBrushing, which is perfect. We're going to control Z just to go back. We'll show you just a little bit cooler. I'm going to introduce you to probably the most biggest menu on the entire platform, and that is B for brush. We have over 250 brushes shipped with ZBrush. And yes, that is maybe a little too much. However, we can narrow this down. Here we have a little something called VDM brushes, vector displacement brushes. And if I go ahead and say C, now I just narrow down all those brushes to every brush that starts with the letter C. And you might notice, it might be a little hard on the screen, so I'm going to go ahead and just pop up this little magnifying glass, this little shift M magnifying glass. And if you notice, I hover over, there's nice, nice little orange letter, and that tells you the final hotkey. So if you're listening to guys like me ramble on and we're saying like BCB, BDS, those are actual hotkeys calling out very specific brushes. The cool thing about ZBrush is you only need to know maybe about 1% of this program to be effective. So if you can do that, you're already winning. So B for brush, C for chisel or creature. I'm going to click this guy. And now, I just picked a VDM brush. And at the top here, you're going to see ears, eyeballs, scales. And what this does is that if I have a mesh like this, and I go ahead and drag this out, I'm going to get some weird ears with a lot of artifacting. 
And that's cool, right? You all should be like, no, that's not cool, Ian. What are you talking about? Well, that's okay, because the other thing that ZBrush kind of put on its head is subdivisions. ZBrush was one of the first applications to ever really come up with subdivisions or multi-resolution mesh. So I'm just going to go ahead. Again, we're not really focused on anything but hotkeys. Control or Command if you're on Mac D. I'm going to subdivide a few times. Now what that did, I'm going to go back. We're going to hover right over here. That says 10,000 active points. That should mean absolutely nothing to you other than the fact that that is the resolution and that is very, very, very tiny. It's very small. So I'm going to go ahead and control D until I get about 2 million. Now, if I go ahead and drag this up, looks a lot cleaner. That's what we want. We want that high resolution. What's cool about ZBrush is the fact that you can actually sculpt at 90 million topology. 120 million, and it's going to look really nice and clean, and it won't crash that often at that resolution. I promise it won't crash. Every program crashes, <laughs> but you get the point. Like, you can really solve the high detail. So now that we know that, the last thing I'll cover is navigation. And for those of you who are graciously watching me kind of mess about, I'm going to show you one hand's in the air, and I got my pen, all right, tablets. Just going to go in the middle space. Now I'm moving around, right? Now I'm going to put this hand down, and I'm going to press the Alt or Option key if you're on Mac. I'm going to press that same empty space, and we're panning. Yeah, we're panning. Nice little sway back and forth. It's OK. We can loosey-goosey. Now while I'm panning, if I let go of Alt, watch what happens. I'm zooming in and out. So you'll see that the way ZBrush works, we just broke the whole mold of like what it is about this UI that's really freaking people out. Because all we focused on was brushes and that Alt or Option key for navigation, which is really all you need to know to get started in ZBrush. And so I implore all of you, if you hadn't tried this, definitely go do that, because then you'll, like, you'll be able to follow along really easily. Now that's, OK, so that was about seven minutes. And now we're going to move on to how do I do this one, right? So first things first is let's reload my gargoyle. So I'm going to say no. I'm going to open up my presentation again. And courtesy of Chad Perkins, who was here previously, he sent me this block out shape in Forger. And he said, Yo, this is the gargoyle I want. And I was like, cool. I'm down. Let's do it. And so immediately, I noticed the pose and the massive wingspan. And I was like, all right, he just gave me a block out. Now what do I do with this? So I immediately emailed him and said, can I have creative freedom? And he was like, yeah, please have creative freedom. Go ahead. You're the artist. So I said, great, fantastic. So what I did was I went back, hit that comma key, which we learned about, opened up this light box. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here to mannequins. And then I'm just going to go ahead and pick any one of these mannequins that's at least human figured ish. And I'm going to go ahead and say, nope, let's go ahead and pop that on. And now I got this guy. Now, the cool thing about mannequins is the fact that they kind of are like IK rigs a little bit. You can actually pick a spot and you can actually come through and move these guys around. And if we do asymmetrical, we can come in, and what I'm doing is I'm clicking a sphere, and I'm getting this nice little cone shape, this white little cone shape. Clicking this is actually going to respect the shape of the actual mannequin. So what we can do with this, and if you are somebody who has ever done traditional sculpting in, uh, like with clay, then you know that this basically resembles an armature. And that's what we want to keep in mind. We don't want to look at ZBrush as a 3D program as every other 3D program that's here in the show today. We've got to look at this more of like, this was designed for sculptors who are moving from traditional to to digital, and in that aspect, give them tools that they're familiar with. So now, what I did was I just clicked over here, and I said, you know what? Let's pose this down, make sure my symmetry's turned on. And then all I did was I came up here and I started moving this around, pivoting this back and forth. Yeah, we got jumping happening right now. And all I'm going to do is kind of come in and start posing this. Now, what's cool about the pose element is the fact that I'm still in symmetry. And most gargoyles, if you go ahead and Google it, which I please, I dare you to do it because it is crazy anatomy. I'm not going to focus on anatomy today. In fact, I care very little about anatomy. All I care about is the feel and the story that I'm telling within my sculpture. So here, I'm just going to go ahead and start placing this in this really interesting pose that gargoyles usually sit in. And I'm just kind of touching about and making the shape work as much as possible. And then this is going to be my starting base. Now, 
as I can go around and I can perfect this and I can do all that good stuff, if I go back to my original project here, I actually pre-baked a few things because we're kind of like a cooking show today. I can't show you everything as much as you'd want, but if you have questions, flag them. But here we go as I actually did a few different poses. So I had my main one right here. There she is, all nice and pretty. She's just staying right there. That's the female mannequin I was working with. Here was pose one. And I was like, okay, yeah, that's pretty cool. And then here was pose two. So I took these poses and I sent them back to Chad and he was like, yeah, pose one looked better. So let's go with that. And I was like, great, wonderful. So what's so powerful about mannequins? We did this whole pose, but we're a sculpting application and I haven't done any sculpting. Well, if I go ahead and hit A, you'll see something really fun happened. Dynamesh. Who knows Dynamesh? Come on, yes. Dynamesh is amazing, especially if you're into 3D printing, because it is an algorithm that keeps your mesh watertight, but it also keeps your mesh updatable. So what I can do is if I have a cool brush like this, uh, let's see, snake hook, snake hook here, yeah, snake hook. If I have something like snake hook here, please say that, okay, yep. This is what Dynamesh does. I'm gonna turn on the wireframe right now. And just for demonstration purposes, I'm gonna come over here and say, make adaptive skin. And when I do that, it creates a new mesh like this. That's no longer a mannequin, but this is now sculptable. So if I open up geometry, which is on the right hand side, and I come on down here to Dynamesh, you'll see this nice Dynamesh button's highlighted orange. This means it's on. And why this is important is because if I pull this out, aha, yeah, little horns, and I press control and I drag this out, rebuilds the surface. So we went from this, which looks really, really bad, to this. And this is also closing holes, deleting the internal surface and making it watertight. And so the reason for this is because I can sculpt with freedom. So I can come through here and as I start stretching that mesh, what you can really start noticing as I'm coming through, let's get a lighter color, especially for those who are online, boom. As you see this mesh is stretching out, I rebuild that surface and now those quads are back. This is super important when you're exploring shapes and forms and trying to get something that looks pretty decent. But also there's another element to this. Notice that my guy is pretty colorful. He's really popping with purples and greens, oranges and whites. So what these are are polygroups. And polygroups is a great way to start isolating and separating out different components of your mesh. So for example, I didn't want this really, like, this arm to be welded to his chest so much. So I'm gonna press Control and Shift together, and I'm going to click one of those polygroups, and that's gonna isolate that polygroup. While still pressing Control and Shift, I can drag an empty space, and now I can start touching the polygroups I wanna to group together. And then what I can do is I can press, hold, uh, press Control and Shift, switch it back, Control W, brand new polygroup. Now that one polygroup is now selected, selectable, so I can always select that arm, all right? But now, wait, there's more, trust me. So I'm gonna grab this. I'm gonna go ahead and just click these legs. Let's go back real fast. Click there. Okay, Control W, get a different color. And then I can just come through and say, yeah, those are gonna be my three sections. Now what's perfect about this is that if we go to Dynamesh, Right next to it is this little button called groups. This will respect your polygroups in the Dynamesh function. Now I just told you Dynamesh takes everything and water tights it, right? So when I press groups, and now watch what happens here. If I look at this one mesh, it's open, okay? If I rebuild this, so go ahead and turn on Dynamesh. You can also real quick, there's a picker button. You can find the resolution, maybe make a small adjustment, rebuild that. Now look what happened on the inside. It shut it down, it closed it off. Now these are separate components, even though I'm on the same mesh, okay? We haven't even talked about subtools, guys. This is a subtool, but we didn't even need to get that way and you should be here and we're, we're working. So now what this means is that at any point in time, I'm gonna grab my clay buildup brush, which I have selected, and I can start sculpting. I can come through down here, find where the clavicle can be. I told you you're not gonna do anatomy, and yet here we are just spitting out anatomy terms. Come in here, build up the deltoid a little bit, right? Just come in and start getting your forms. And as I'm stretching this, control drag, boom, I broke it. Yeah, okay, this happens sometimes. Don't be scared, it's, it's fine. I'm gonna control Z, so what did that mean? Sometimes when you're dynameshing, you're working with polygroups, you get what's called intersecting meshes 
right? They just run into each other and they smash it. There's a fix for this. And I'm actually glad this showed up. That was not planned. But it happens even to us pros. So I'm going to come down here to geometry, mesh integrity. And these are the two most magical buttons in all of ZBrush. We're going to check the mesh integrity. And it's going to say, yo, you have 320 edges that are colliding. That's not good. So I'm going to go ahead and say, OK, that's fine. So I'm going to come in here and say, fix mesh. And you might not have seen it, but it did say, hey, your fixed mesh is it's completed. You're good. So if I check this again, it didn't pop up with those errors. So now if I go back to my DynaMesh and I rebuild that, done. Say we didn't have that Swiss cheese happen. So for those of you online, especially you watching, that happens. Don't worry. It's all good. So I can keep coming through, and I can start building up my forms. And this is how I started approaching the gargoyle. Now what's fun about gargoyles is the fact is that they don't really look all that attractive. I mean, they're demon-esque characters, but really, like, it wasn't about it wasn't about like, does this thing look super pretty? It was really about like, what does this element say? So I can go through this whole thing and start building that out, but that's going to be way too long. We're already 60 minutes in, so instead, we're going to showcase you the fastest way to make wings in ZBrush. Anybody here try to make a wing? Yeah, I see you nodding. Yeah, we're okay. Cool, perfect. So. Do you know what the curve tri fill brush is? Cool. Curve tri fill is my favorite wing brush. I'm just going to read, I'm going to try to get the developers to be like, okay, this is Ian's wing brush. Reason why is because, check this out, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to draw out a wing. Done. Go home. We're out of here, right? There it is. There's my wing. Now, what's cool about this is the fact that you notice there's a curve here. This is this nice little curve. These are called curves in ZBrush. And the reason why they're curves is because I can actually adjust them. I can make them bigger. I can adjust the brush size and make them smaller. It's super just, it's really adaptable for what I'm trying to achieve. So I'm going to go ahead and move that there. Perfect. And what's neat about curves is the fact is, is that I can adjust them however I like. If I grab this curve here, I can blow this up a little bit. For some reason, my pen stopped working. So I'm going to back up here. All right, there we go. So what happened to my brush? Hold on. Let me, let me go back and redo this for two seconds. There we go. Draw this out. Boop. There's my wing. So I got this curve here. Now what I can do is I can move this around. All right? This curve is allowing me to adjust this however I want. I could tangle it up on itself, too, and make a knot. Don't do that. But you could. <laughs> you could. But here, I can go ahead and like fine tune this. But when I'm satisfied, I touch anywhere on the single mesh. And now notice that my mannequin got dark. So what happened there? Well, that's called a mask. And a mask is something that we can use to protect our model in ZBrush. So if I were to try to sculpt on this right now, so if I zoom in on this mask and I start sculpting, it's not going to happen. If I press Control and tap an empty space, it inverts the mask. So reason for this is that I can either sculpt on this mesh here. I actually want a smaller curve. So I'm going to go ahead and grab the Curve Tri Fill brush, make it just a little bit smaller. I'm going to tap anywhere one time to get rid of the curve. Now I'm going to go to Subtool, Split, and I'm going to split my unmasked points. So now my wings are gone. They're bide. But we're in solo mode, so they're actually there. It's just now we introduced ourselves to Subtools. And Subtools over here on the right-hand side is where we actually keep our additional tools of our model. The easiest way to look at this, especially for you sculptors out there, is that the way this is set up is kind of how a sculpture desk would be set up. I have my model in the middle of my desk, and I have my tools on either the left side or the right. So my tools, my brushes, those are on the left side, and my clay is on the right side. And that is the kind of controlled chaos of ZBrush's UI. It's really something that just once you understand that aspect, every time I need a brush or to sculpt with something, I go to the left-hand side. But if I need to do something like grab some more clay or add a new component to my mesh, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to set that. It's on the right side. So those are elements that really help expand everything out. So really think of it in that term. And notice we haven't even touched the top menu here. And really, quite frankly, we don't really need to because today is just all about getting in and making something. So now that we have our wings here, I want to pose these wings. So we're going to introduce the gizmo, W. W opens up the gizmo, Q closes it. So you can start to get the theme here. ZBrush is very keyboard driven. 
which is important because, again, you're just kind of always having your hands on your model in some way, shape, or form, and those hotkeys make it really fast and effective to pick up the next brush. So here I'm going to go ahead and I want to actually make some adjustments. So I'm going to press and hold Alt, which right here on the gizmo, we have the unlock or the lock. Pressing Alt opens it, letting go closes it. So the way I can do this is I can press and hold Alt and center this off to my mesh or pose this however I want. And now I can let go of Alt and I can start rotating. Whoops, wrong guy. Let's actually go down a sub tool. And we'll do that again. We'll come over here and we'll start rotating this around. Moving the arrow keys, we're moving this all in space. Now here's the thing, real quick crash course, the blue, the green, the red arrows, those are axis driven. The white ones, that's craziness. You're just going all over the place and you're crossing streams or axes rather. You're just kind of going all over the place. So if I'm visually this way and I move this white one, this can move in depth both on, on all three axes. So, if you want to move more specifically, just focus on the red, the blue, or the green to get that position moved. Same with the rotation. So I can come through here and pivot this in. And now we want to bend it. And the gut reaction I see is, well, let's mask this off and let's arc it. And well, that, that, can, be, that can be one way. Or we can do bend deformers, which is a game changer. And that's still within the gizmo, believe it or not. It's hidden. It's a little ZBrush gym, as we call it. So if I go over here to my gizmo, and I look at this cog wheel right here, and I click it, I get a cool list. This is my special list. This is where we can start bending things. So I can come over here to bend curve. And you'll notice now that I have a little orange dot, a little blue cone and some stuff here. Little orange cones, whites, reds, and greens, all different colors. If you hover over it, down at the bottom, it'll actually say what it is. It's curve resolution, OK? Now, all this might seem kind of chaotic, but really all you need to really focus on today is that orange clone is going to give me more dots. And those dots are going to let me bend it. So I can come through here and bend my wing. And then I can add more with this cone. I also have other cones that let me flex and flap. Whoop, 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 whoop. Or I can add some more resolution and really get some more fine tuning here. Now, the thing to remember is that this little cogwheel went from gray to orange. What does this mean? This means that you have a bend curve or a deformer that is active. And this is what you want to keep orange until you're ready to go. Once you're done and you're happy with your wing, you can come through here and you can actually click that orange cogwheel and then say accept. And now your wings are shaped. And that's really all it is to it. Now you could have bent your wings like I showed you with the curve, but the bend deformers are real game changers, especially when you're trying to manipulate mesh very, very quickly. So it's a really fast way to make a wing. We just use the curve tri brush and then a bend, uh, curve deformer, and here we are. So this is how I ended up blocking out this character. Now we're going to move forward a little bit because we only have so much time today. We can't hang out all the time. But we went from this, and then if I open this guy up, a lot of steps happen. But let's go ahead and solo this out for a second. And let's just look at this. So I sculpted the anatomy. I got everything blocked in. But you'll notice that right here, there's a little bit of a change of mesh. We have subdivisions on. So I drop this down and then step it back up, we have the multi-resolution. So far, I showed you the Dynamesh section of it. So how did I get from Dynamesh, sketching and getting something alike, to getting clean topology? That is Z-Remesher. And Z-Remesher is going to be something that you guys are just going to love. So we're actually going to attempt to do this on this mesh here. Instead of just a sphere or a cube or something like that, we're going to get crazy. I'm going to come through here. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to delete lower. And I'm going to go ahead with Dynamesh, grab that picker, pick my resolution, set this to Dynamesh, let this turn on real quick. Now you can see if I zoom in, that mesh looks way different. This is now Dynamesh, right? So in order to utilize the power of Z-Remesher, think of Z-Remesher as auto-retopology. I always tell everybody, if you're going to do any type of deforming animation or any type that really needs to control the mesh, Z-Remesher can get you most of the way there. If you work with a cool team and you can show them you can use it well, see if they'll let you use it so you don't have to manually retopologize everything. 
maybe a character apologizing, but Rox, Zebra Mesh is your best friend. So, with this here, because he's going to be a giant cool rock, aka statue, we're going to go ahead and Zebra Mesh him. So, here's my secret sauce. This is the magic behind Zebra Mesher. I'm going to go ahead and just quickly explain one of the new features, which is in Zebra Mesher, we have this retry button. This is actually new in 2023. What this will do is allow you to remember the first state that we're initiali initializing the Zebra Mesh. So what we can do is we can go ahead and say, you know what, this is like 2.7 million topology. This is massive. And what I want is something that's like a fraction of this. I want the, re the low resolution to be low enough that it's usable, but not too low that it looks like just a bunch of little blocks, right? I need it to, re to retain the shapes that I have. So I'm going to go ahead and scale this down to say something like 35 is fine. I'm going to keep Adapt turned on because what Adapt does is it looks at the surface of your mesh. And it's going to go ahead and tell ZRush, listen, this mesh, you need to protect this, OK? But we also need to change the sizes of the quads as we're going to go in Zebra Mesh. So we can have bigger quads, smaller quads. I actually want all the quads to be the same size. So what we're going to do is we're going to come down here to Adaptive Size, which is a slider down at the bottom. And it's usually set to 50. Slide that to 0. This will keep your quads as even as possible. And then I'm going to turn on Keep Groups, which is just referring back to this poly group. But Keep Groups has a feature called Smooth Groups. And I use this to make sure that the mesh itself, it's not shrinking, it's just kind of smoothing out. And I don't want it to do that so much. So it might appear that it's shrinking, but in reality, it's just taking my sharp edges and really smoothing that. So instead, we're going to go ahead and say, don't do that. And everything else, we're going to leave that blank. I do see this all the time where they're like, yeah, detect edges, keep poly paint, keep creases, do that. Don't do this. That's going to like, it's just going to confuse Zebra Mesher. It's only as smart as, as it is. It's not, it's not super intelligent. So instead, we're going to say, just focus on the one thing. And now I'm going to brave this here, OK? This is the before state. So we're going to stamp this right here. I'm going to move this over. We're going to say Zebra Mesher. Now, I say brave this because sometimes this is your coffee break. Sometimes you turn on Zebra Mesher and you go into the kitchen and you wait a little bit. ZBrush is uh, patience is key. Just remember that. <laughs> so, but there we go. And now I have something that's looking a lot better. And notice it retained the shape, but there's your difference. You went from DynaMesh to Zebra Mesher that quickly. And how, I don't know if anybody here, pop quiz, what was the topology count before? Yeah, exactly, yeah. It's in the millions. Look at that now. 60,000. That's it. That's nothing, OK? So, but you're saying, <laughs> you lost all your detail. Congratulations. And I'm going to say, yeah, I did. But there's a feature that I love so much, and it replaces the way ZBrush used to be even five years ago, and that's project history. Now, history at the very, very top this is actually every stroke or movement you make, ZBrush remembers. So if you're saving a project file, this is actually something that you can save. You can save these timelines with you. But in this case, we didn't really need to do that. But it had remembered everything that I'd done before, which means I can step back in time at any point, right? But now I want to project that, that detail back. So I'm going to go back in time to a point that had that nice information. I'm going to go ahead and press and hold Control or Command if you're on Mac. Type that one time, and now I got a little white bar up there. Okay, this tells ZBrush, remember this point in time. This is like a really like good time memory. Remember that. We're gonna go back up into the front, and now we're gonna subdivide a few times. So just control D, get that back up to say, yeah, 3 million, 3.8 million. That's fine. Now, what I'm gonna do is we're gonna come over here to Subtool. I'm gonna scroll on down here to Project or Protect. And then we're going to say, project our history. And it's going to say, did you want poly paint with that? If you had poly paint, aka vertex coloring, you can absolutely say yes. We didn't have any coloring on here. We haven't even covered that today. So we're just going to say no, or just say always. It doesn't really matter. So let's go ahead and just say no. It's going to think for a second. And again, sometimes this is a coffee break moment. You see the little orange bar at the very top as it's going across? It's just processing. See, ZBrush is 
98.9% CPU driven, not GPU. So ZBrush is actually really functioning on the back end of the machine, the brain of it. So it's actually good because you can take a 10-year-old machine, 10-year-old from today, like an older gaming machine, you can use ZBrush. That's how effective ZBrush can actually be. But sometimes, depending on how heavy your machine is, you might get faster results or slower results. So I always implore you to check the specs of your machine because they're not always comparable. This one's pretty fast. And, but there we go. We are done. And there we had our before and our after. All the detail got back. Now, why this is important is because if I wanted to like come through here and start working on the surface, but I needed to make a bigger change, I can step down my subdivisions and work at this level. And when I do that, let's say we wanted to give them bigger shoulders, a little bolder shoulder action right here. We can come through, give them some bigger shoulders, and then now watch what happens. I've stretched the topology just a little bit, but when I step back up, that detail's there. That's the, that's the power of multi-resolution when you're working through trying your sculptures and get, getting that fine detail. That's why ZBrush is so powerful, is it's there for the high fidelity. But allowing you to step down means you can come through and make changes. Now, one other thing that has happened that's new to 2023, this one's my favorite. It's called proxy pose. So I just explained multi-resolution and why that's super important, right? Well, here, if we go under geometry and we come over here to proxy pose, proxy pose is a new feature that creates a proxy mesh that's like a cage. And what this will do is it will protect any model you have that's DynaMesh, Tessimated, or it has subdivisions on it. So here, let's say I did want to make a change to his head. Just it's, it's too small, or maybe it's too big. So I'm going to go ahead and, again, what I want to do just to really showcase this is I'm going to stamp this, OK? And now I'm going to go through here. And I want you to focus on this slider right here, which is called the reduction amount. And as I slide this down, it is building a cage that's triangulated. And I can go as low as I need to, right? That might be a little too much, but it's basically working on a percentage. Now, that mesh right there on the left-hand side, that's 3.8 million. If I let go here, and I'm utilizing 5.9% of the topology, when that's 29,000. That's a lot easier to work with, right? So here now, what I can do is I can come over here to brush, press and hold control. And let's grab our mass lasso. And I'm just going to lasso off his head here. And what's cool about this is that I can mask this section off. I can control tap, invert, and I can blur the mask. And now I can go ahead and take the gizmo. I can scale this down or scale this up, right? Now, let's actually just go Beetlejuice here. We're getting to Halloween time. Clear this mask out, because this is the new look. And now watch what happens to the mesh. We're going to zoom right in here in his head. We're going to turn proxy pose off. Mesh is clean again. But not only is it clean again, it has subdivisions. This is why it's my favorite. You can make big changes to mesh that's super dense really, really easily. So proxy pose, again, it's not a projection. It is a cage system that just allows you to stay in control. I like this Hulk version of this gargoyle. You guys like, yeah, we're going to keep them, right? So this is where we're at now. And now here, we need, to, we need to give them a pedestal, though, because there's not a single gargoyle that doesn't sit on something, hence the pose, right? So we're going to move into away from organic sculpting, which is what ZBrush is known for. And we're going to move into some hard surface modeling. Now, I do get this question a lot. Does ZBrush do hard surface? Yep, it really, really does. In fact, it's really interesting because ZBrush does hard surface completely for the most part with one brush, and that is called Z-Modeler. So how does Z-Modeler work? What is it, and why should I use it today? Well, if we just go ahead and grab a simple cube, so I'm going to come over here, grab this cube. I'm going to quickly explain what Z-Modeler is. Now, I said it's a brush, right? And so that's all I'm going to be picking. It's just this brush over here, which is Z-Modeler. If I hover over a edge, a point, or a face and press and hold the space bar, I get a whole new menu system. Yeah, I saw that face. Don't worry. This looks daunting. But let's look at this in a simpler light. Very, very top, order of operations. What is the action I'm trying to do? Well, I hovered over a face, so maybe I want to extrude. What happened to my menu? 
It changed, right? So now my menu is different. Every time I pick an action, I get different effects. So here, if I want to go ahead and extrude, now I just have to say, well, what am I targeting? What is it that I'm actually extruding? Well, I want to extrude every single polygon on the planet that's on this mesh. And then down here at the modifiers, don't worry about those modifiers. That comes later. The trick with modifiers is that if you want to modify something, try them out for yourself, but really forget they exist right now. Just focus on action, target. That back and forth is going to help you out. So now, if I hover over here, I'm just extruding all of those polygons. Now, here's the cool part. I'm going to control Z. Go back, press that space bar. I just said that every poly group that was there, I want to go ahead and affect that. But what that's affecting, if I create a temporary selection by pressing and holding Alt and just quickly selecting those different faces, if I do it again, it affects only that poly group. So how can we use this to our benefit? Well, we need him to sit on some sort of pillar, right? So what we're going to do is we're first going to simplify our shape. And we can do this really cool. I've never met a box that had this kind of point on top. So let's change that first. I'm going to open up the gizmo, hit that cog wheel. I'm going to hit this poly cube. This is my favorite cube because it's perfectly quadded. <laughs> It's probably like the best thing ever. So I love this little cube. So now what I can do is I, with this cube, I can actually just go ahead and start affecting how many coins or how many edges I actually want to have. And then I can just switch back over to the gizmo. And I can crush this down, say something like that. And that's already going to be kind of a nice little shape that I'm working on. Let's go ahead and temporarily hide this base. And let's come back over here. Let's bring them down. And this yellow square, we're going to scale this up. So if we hover over this, we're going to scale that and get that relatively in place. Now, I was talking about Z Modeler and how cool it is, and I immediately went to the gizmo. That's because I just wanted to place it and get something quickly. Now we can start working on this. So if I hover over this, I want to actually create like a nice little circular you know, pillar for him to sit on. But the top needs to be flat and squared. So instead, I'm going to go ahead and hover over an edge. And I'm going to say, I want to insert, that's my action, multiple edge loops, OK? And what I can do is I can now drag out multiple edge loops, or I can just drag out one that's perfectly in the middle. And then I can just touch and repeat that action. Every time I do something with Z Modeler, let's say I do like, I do an extrusion on this side here. So I come over and I do extrude. And then I tap over here and here, and I press that one time. That, that touch just repeats that last action that you did. So here, I was just able to quickly come through, do a single edge loop, tap. Now I got perfect symmetry, perfect in the middle. Now I can hover over this point, and I can go ahead and I can, let's come over here. Let's get a little bit more visualization right there. Perfect. Now I want to split this. I'm going to draw that out. And now what I can do, hover back over the space, press and hold the space bar. I'm going to introduce you to QMesh. QMesh is extrude on steroids. It's like one of my favorite features because I'm going to drag this out. So let's come back over, make sure all is selected. The other cool part about Z Modeler when you're dragging out faces is pressing this Alt key 100,000 times and getting different colors. And what's cool about this is that I can go ahead and do this action, and then I can change those different groups to make different colors. Now, I just broke that, so don't mind that. Let's back up. Control Z. Now, QMesh, why is QMesh so important? I just like told you it was amazing. Well, let's actually do this. Let's hover over an edge and create a single edge loop right there. And now I need these two faces to meet that edge. But let's say I'm in extrude first. So I have my extrude actions. I'm coming through. But I, I need it to be perfectly right there. So, right? so if I have to come in here and try to line this up, that's just too much time. That's a waste of time. Instead, I'm going to come over to QMesh. I'm going to start dragging. Look, it snapped immediately. And it's not just a snap because it met up with it, became best friends, high-fived each other, and went to Starbucks. It actually welded itself to that edge. So now I can come through and say, you know what? And I need these two to connect to each other right here. So I'm going to need that to connect over. 
And I need these two to, not these two. Don't select the two, just the one. And that snaps. So each time I make a different selection, it's just snapping to it. And that is important. So anytime I need to extrude something, QMesh is going to be the thing that we're going to be working with today. And speaking of that, let's come back over. Let's create this little edge loop here. And I'm going to create an edge loop here. And speaking of which, I need to select all these different components. But I'm going to do this quickly by hovering over this edge, grabbing the space bar, and saying polygroup, make a new polygroup. Now, here's the fun part about ZMesh or Z, uh, Z Modeler, is that it remembers the last action you set it to on the face, the edge, or the point. So I don't have to keep switching back and forth. If I remember that it's QMesh is set to the face, just go ahead and start dragging that out. Just immediately, you don't have to worry about anything else. So you can come through and start making that selection. Okay? So these are ways that you can start modeling your objects together. You can also come through here and say, you know what, I want to inset these areas and give me something like this with maybe just a little bit of depth. So we'll switch back to zero mesh and we'll kind of put this up just like that. Right? And we can come through here and we can start really focusing on it. And this is how you can use Z Modeler. Now, if you want to do a little bit of tricky stuff, I'll show you some cool, neat stuff, which is going back to like the originally using initialize to set up your seam. If I wanted to have a little bit more of an in depth, realistic approach, don't think that you have to Z Modeler everything from a cube. You don't have to do everything welded together. You can actually do other really cool tricks. Like, for example, if I actually wanted to have a circular panel coming out, but I don't want it welded, go back over here, come over here on this split, draw the split out. I actually want this to be something like that. Now with QMesh, I'm going to start dragging this out, but watch what happens when I press Control. It splits that face off. Face off. Boop. Anybody remember that movie? Yeah, it's okay, cool, thank you. You bailed me out right now. So now I have this guy, and now I can cue this out. Now I have two completely different objects in my scene. I can mask this section off, invert that, come on through, and I can actually start manually placing this wherever I would like to, and I can work with this. And this is something that will actually help me out a little bit more. Now, this isn't enough faces for what I'm going for today, so we're going to go back to subdivisions. And here's something that's really effective, is that you might notice that there is a little bit of a creased edge. This might be a little bit hard to see. So a creased edge, if I come over here to geometry, crease, and I uncrease everything, look at this line. It looks a little thin right now. This might be really hard to see. That's a thin line, believe me. Now what I can do is if I go ahead and come over here to crease by polygroups, you'll notice that we got a little creased. The difference is, is if I subdivide without it, so I'm going to come over here. It's math. Subdivide without it rounds everything off, smoothing it. I don't want that. So instead, what I'm going to do is I really want this guy right here to subdivide and have a nice sharp edge so I can crease by polygroups. And then I can go ahead and start dividing. Now, you'll notice that the top got rounded, but the, the sharp edges on the bottom did not. And that's OK. We could fix that, right? So we can do that really quickly. So instead here, what we can do is we can come down here to the bottom. Polygroups, again, this is where all my clay stuff is at, so I'm actually going to be affecting this model in the middle. And I'm going to come here and say group by normals. And what this did was it took every face that's at least a 45 degree angle or greater, and it went through and gave it a new polygroup. And when I do this now, when I come over here to crease and crease by polygroups, now everything with a new polygroup got a crease on it. And if there's areas like this crease right here, we don't really want this guy, press and hold space bar. We're going to go to crease, and we're just going to press and hold alt and uncheck the things that we don't want. So I don't want that crease, and I don't want that crease. So now when I go ahead and control D, start dying, now all the edges I want to protect are nice and protected, and I can subdivide with ease. Now, if you really want to get if you really want to get tricky, really clever here, we can use these subdivisions to our advantage. A lot of times, you're like, this is my base shape. I'm stuck with it. No, we're not. In fact, what we can do is we can subdivide one time, Control D, and then over here, I can delete lower and make this my new subdivision level. While this is important is because if we need something to be what we think is relatively low, and somebody says, you know what? Hey, that's pretty low, but can you go lower? If you did this, 
Underneath the divide, we have reconstruct subdivision, and it'll rebuild back the previous subdivision even though you deleted it. So it's going to remember that. And so here, I can come through at any point in time, just delete lower, and I know that's going to stay. Now, why this is really cool is because, of course, I'm going to come through, go to auto groups. I am running out of time here. So we're going to come here to polygroups, auto groups, which will give me now different polygroups based on the objects that are not welded together. And I can isolate this one guy, and I can work with this all by itself. And here now, I want to give this some actual like texture. It's way too round. It's not really attractive. So I'm going to go ahead and split hidden and work on this shape. And now I'm just going to go ahead, pressing hold all, I'm just going to select every other section here. Just really fast, just to give me that kind of section. And now I'm going to hover over here, Q mesh, and I'm going to drag this panel out just a little bit. And now, again, I need these edges here to be nice and sharp. So instead of doing all that manually, just come back down here to polygroups. We're going to do group by normals. It looks beautiful. And then we're going to come over here to crease. So geometry, Whee! crease, and crease all those polygroups. And now if I start subdividing a little bit more, it's going to keep that nice shape, that nice shape for me. And do that. And let's pretend that we are done so I don't bore you the rest of the way. And this is where we ended up. And I just basically repeated those shapes until I got something I wanted. And now we need to start prepping this to send this over to GoZ for Cinema 4D. Because that's the whole point. I got to get it back to Chad. Poor Chad's waiting on this model and he's like, bro, hurry up. So what we're going to do instead is I had all those nice shapes. And we're going to go ahead and I just merge things together. And the way I did that, if we pop back over here real fast, is that you'll notice I kept everything in a folder. And that's because organization's key. If you ever need to put something in a folder, just hover over that edge, shift F, say, this is a folder, I promise you. Boop. Now that's in a folder, and you can drag other things in it. But let's say you needed everything but one object in the folder. There's a little trick for that. What you could do is turn on the gizmo. And this guy right here, this is called the pizza box. Actually, it's called transpose all selected subtools. But I think Pizza Box is a little cooler. So we're going to go ahead and turn that on. And why we're going to do that is you'll notice that everything becomes anti-aliased. Looks like an old CTR TV. It's like, poor guy. So what we can do is actually select a few different of components. And then now these, these two objects that are not together are now together. If I hit Control F again, it's going to pop up a new menu. Let's go ahead and turn that off, say, there it is. It's going to say everything you have visibly selected. Do you want to put that in a folder? So if you have 1,576 subtools and you need to put all of them in a folder, this is what you do. Turn on the pizza box, Gizmo pizza box, say yep. And then go ahead and say yes. Also, I don't know if that's an actual number of subtools you can have. That seems like a lot, but that's the point. Exaggerative just a bit. And then we can call this pillar. And if I spelled that wrong, please don't judge me too hardly. You can judge me afterwards. All right, now all of that got into a folder, which is right down here. That's my pillar folder, and those are the two objects. So at any point in time, you can easily group all that stuff together. So now again, we're going to fast forward to where we started to where we ended up. And right now, the thing is, is that I got three shapes, but Chad reached out to me and said, hey, make sure everything's on one tool. And I said, no problem. So I took the first shape right here, which is my final one. Again, subtools on the right-hand side. And I'm going to merge this down. And when I did that, and you could say, well, how did you do that? Basically, all I did was if I had two objects together, so let's insert some basic shapes. Let's insert a cone. And let's insert a cube. And let's hide everything but those two things. And make sure you can see it's two things. All I need to do is come through here. And I need to come on down to Subtool, Merge, Merge Down. And that's going to merge those two shapes together. Once you do that, you take your objects, and you get something that looks like this. My pillar, my gargoyle, all together. Now, Cinema 4D, amazing program, but I cannot throw 90 plus million topology at it. I don't know another program that handles that kind of topology. And if you do, let me know. ZBrush is pretty high. But I need to get this decimated down. I need to get it so it's a sizable chunk, but I don't lose any details. So how do I do that? Well, what I'm going to do 
is now this is actually about 1.2, so crazy me is going to subdivide that up just to prove a point and say 5.7 million. And I'm going to go ahead and go to geometry and delete lower. So now I have all this topology, super dense, so dark you can't even see it. So now we got to say, well, how do you do this? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to go up to Z plugin. I'm going to dock this over here. And if you didn't know you can do that, this is the first time we're going to the menu session while you're hanging out with me. Z plugin has a lot of really cool plugins that were made by multiple people who've worked at uh, ZBrush, including Joseph Drust. So shout out to him. He's made a good chunk of these that ship with ZBrush. And so by clicking this little orange, this little white icon here, you drag that over, and you can customize your menu. So if you were like, yo, I need to have the tool section over here, where it happened to it, let's open that up. Let's close this one down. You can come over here to tool. So you can customize ZBrush a little bit. So you can say, you know what, I actually want this over here and over there. It's up to you. You can customize. But now we're going to come up here to Decimation Master. And this is what the idea of this is take a big file size, retain all of the geometry, all of the fidelity that you've worked so hard on doing, and kick that down to something manageable. So I can go through every single button here, but that would take way too long, and I don't have that kind of time. And I don't think you want to be bored by me anymore. So we're going to focus down here to the custom function. And Chad was very, very specific. He said, I want you to be at 406,000 active points. I said, OK, that sounds good. So now that I've said that custom slider over, I'm going to go ahead and custom. Now again, I've done this a lot here. We're going to look at this topology right here. Control shift just to stamp that. Now I'm going to go ahead and say custom. And this is our final coffee break for the day. After that, we punch out and we go home. And here, you're going to see that it's pre-processing. It's looking at everything that my model is, from the high fidelity to the density and to what it is, like whether it's dynameshed or whether it's subdivided. And it's going to go ahead and process this and give me a triangulated mesh that preserves all of that detail. And that detail is what we want to keep, but we still want to send that over to Chad so he can do his final render, which if you watched the previous one, he did showcase that, which was awesome. Now again, you notice that orange bar at the top? That's because it's thinking. When ZBrush is thinking, pens down. It's like, time's up. Take a break. Go look at something else. That 2020 rule, you work 20 minutes, you look away for 20 minutes. That kind of process. This really helps with that. It's a hidden feature. I made that up. OK, good. So at now, we're almost done. So we're going from 5.772 million, which is just, that's well, not too bad, actually. I'd say most of my projects are about 20, 30 million on average. And we're going to kick this on down. It's almost there. You can do it. Chicka, 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 choo, choo. Almost there. Almost. All right, it's thinking. We got to that last part. It's just doing a reorder process. And then it's going to go ahead and spit out a final triangulated mesh. And what we're going to do is that's 406,000 on the dot. Chad's going to be so happy. Now we take a look at this integrity. We zoom in here. Notice all that fine detail is still there. It's all there. It's all pretty. And now all we need to do is kick it to Chad. And in ZBrush, now, because we're part of the Maxon family, we're still relatively new, even though we've been there, for, we've been here like going on almost, almost two years now. Maybe it's a little over two years. But now what we can do is we can go back over to the tool palette, OK? And we actually have a GoZ function, which is right here. Now, real fast, GoZ, there are three buttons. Quickly explaining it, GoZ, if you click this one button, the subtool that you have selected, that's the only one that gets sent over to whatever program you're sending it over. Then you have All, which takes every single subtool, whether it can see it or not. Interview port, it's going to send that over. And then you have visible, which is everything that is visible. So here, notice I have four different subtools. And the only one that I have selected is this one right here. And so if I hide everything else and just have this one, I come over here next to this R button. This will actually tell me what is actually it's being sent to. We do send to Cinema 4D, Maya, and some other programs as well, 3ds Max. So if I have that, that's the one that's current. Now if I come here and say Go Z. It's going to go ahead and take a look at that. Look, Cinema 4D wasn't even launched. It's going to launch that for you. And then it's going to plop that scene in there. Now, it might come in at a different scale. So always check your scale, whatever scene you're sending into. There are ways to go about that, but I'm almost running out of time now. So we're going to let this happen. And that's 54 minutes on the dot. So I think that's pretty much going to wrap me up. Thank you guys so much. Are there any questions? Please feel free to ask. No? You good? 
Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you guys very, very much for everything. And if you're looking to get interested in ZBrush, starting ZBrush, I'm the lead ZBrush trainer, but thankfully we had Anna Carolina here earlier today. If you go to maxon.net, we actually have a whole new 27 part getting started series. Don't let the number 27 scare you because I think the longest video there is like seven minutes, on average about four minutes, very digestible. All right, here we go. Now you can see that we have it loaded in here in Cinema 4D. Let's let it think for five seconds. There it goes. Hold on one second. OK, perfect. Just coming up with some terms of agreements. Fix updates. Yay, we fixed it. Cool. Uh, cancel out of that. OK. Well, you can see that it's there. I don't know why it's not letting me click that button, but it is there. I promise you that. Now, go back. Baby, come back. All right. Well, that is it for me again, guys. Thank you so much, and I'll catch you later. Bye. All right, everyone. We do have time for some questions for Ian. Question number one. Right here in the front, Alec. So no. the question is Decimation Master. Decimation Master has been around, uh, I want to say, seven years. Yeah. Yeah, most of the tools I use, the only ones are the ones I called out, like the retry function. That, that one, that's new. Um, and proxy pose, that's new. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? All right, you can actually uh, check out Ian Weekly, right? You're uh, live. T tell them a little bit about that, where they yeah. can find you live. So if you go to the Maxon or Old ZBrush channel on YouTube, I am live there most Wednesdays. Today's Wednesday, so you got me in person. Yeah. Most Wednesdays at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time to noon. So I take questions, we go through processes, we do projects together, and we go over all ZBrush stuff. Yeah. So if you missed them here and you have questions and you forget, and you remember next Wednesday, tune in. So yeah. Ian will be available at the Dell booth after this for any questions. Uh, and stay tuned. We're going to be closing out with EJ Hassenfrat. So see you in about 10 minutes. Woo. Ciao. <laughs>